All right, friends, we're back at it. And today we will be talking about chapter two in your textbook, which is on facility management. The chapter has several objectives. The first objective is for us to understand facility management and what a facility manager actually does. Piggybacking off of that first objective, the second objective is for us to understand and appreciate the complex kinds of duties that are necessary to manage a facility. And keeping in mind there's higher level uh, responsibilities and duties and then there's more technical responsibilities and duties. And then finally, the textbook wants us to understand the different stakeholders that very well might impact a facility. So with that in mind, let's get started. So what is facility management? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Facility management really refers to the broad types of disciplines and quick, uh, characteristics and skills that an individual uses as part of running a facility. So someone who is a who works in facility management really has a broad diverse array of disciplines, sort of that euphemism, a jack of all trades. And they uh, might have, uh, from a facility management standpoint, facility management really entails a variety of skills, such as things involving planning or design or um, more leadership oriented aspects, such as goal setting and uh, communication skills, good communication skills and then also technical skills uh, necessary in order to run the facility. So really, it's a mix of business skills and technical skills and being able to learn on the job. And, and I would ask you to think about, well, what do you think is the most important skill and why? And we can talk about that at a later point in time, but it's a diverse array, a diverse range of skills that the textbook references. So. When surveyed, uh, facility managers actually said that maintenance is an issue that really takes up the majority of their time, and then followed by um, space management, and then uh, interior design, and then budgeting, forecasting, and other financial issues. So a successful facility manager really is going to have a diverse, wide-ranging um, uh amount of abilities and those abilities are going to allow them to participate and not just um, the higher level aspects such as uh, the planning and uh, the forecasting but then all and then the organizing but then also have the technical aspects such as maybe engineering or maintenance or facilities or operations um, so it's, it's really a facility manager needs to have both uh, higher level abilities, which we'll talk about shortly, and then more technical skills. But really, um, top management skills could be the ability to delegate, the ability to communicate uh, properly, to uh, effectuate, effectively communicate a message, to understand organizational structure, but then also customer service. Uh, the textbook mentioned that a um, uh, about 90% or so of issues of, at a facility can be resolved at the customer service level. The textbook also says that really the primary duty and responsibility of a facility manager is to keep the patrons safe and secure. So um, the baseline um, responsibility and duty is really security of those within the facility, but then the more nuanced aspects are in regard to customer service experience, uh, being able to deal with um, the emerging aspects of a um, of a um, of, of a facility. So it could be something involving um, sustainability or a green technology, or maybe uh, trying to broaden the diversity of the workplace. So those new, newer skills from that are emerging issues within the facilities field are then married with the more um, traditional skills and abilities with planning 
in organizing and executing and evaluating, coupled with the technical knowledge. So it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty diverse range of jobs, and really, a facility manager's responsibilities become even more uh, stressful when they are dealing with a unique facility, such as we have the water cube in in Beijing, uh, or maybe uh, something uh, that has historical significance, um, like let's say uh, Madison Square Garden or uh, Fenway Park. Uh, with the United States. So these even add to greater amounts of challenges within an organization. Now, the core aspects of facility management from a managerial standpoint relates to the planning, organizing, implementing, and controlling of responsibilities. And the textbook lays out these different aspects in detail um, starting with planning, both referring to short-term and long-term planning, and then uh, once those once those objectives are um, uh, ferreted out, how an organization is going to actually uh, organize itself to meet those objectives, and then implementing those plans, and then evaluating your results. So starting with the planning standpoint, uh, planning is really about things such as mission statements or goals, objectives, and tactics. And a mission statement is commonly defined as an organization's overall reason for its existence. And why are we here? Why are we doing this? So a mission statement here that the text lays out is, the New Haven Flounders are dedicated to providing wholesome family entertainment at a reasonable price. That's their reason for existence. Now, strategic goals are intended uh, to be um, a mechanism for an organization to actually achieve a specific outcome. In fact, it's giving more parameters. It's being more specific. So the New Haven uh, flounders might be dedicated to that wholesome family entertainment at a reasonable price. And then in order to effectuate that, the team is going to sell out at least 10 home games, uh, probably using um, strategies that promote and provide wholesome family entertainment and are being uh, marketed at a reasonable price point. Goals are going to be um, even more specific criteria to uh, in terms of how you're going to meet these uh, your uh, your mission statement. And the textbook uses this. SMART acronym, S-M-A-R-T, and I think that this is a, a great acronym because uh, it talks about specific, uh, be, having it be specific. Um, so the goal needs to be specific rather than a vague statement. Um, it needs to be, um, it needs to be measurable in terms of a specific measurable element to evaluate the goal or whether or not the goal was in reach. So um, it might be uh, taking data. So specific might be uh, the 10 home games within a season uh, achievable. Uh, you need to be able to show um, that you were actually able to do this. So maybe there's a, um, uh, it, it's in terms of you can measure the data to either prove or disprove whether or not the um, goal was met. And then time-based um, is you need to make sure that it was within a specific time frame. And then, uh, as I said, so it's smart, it's specific, measurable, achievable, results-based, and time-bound. So again, you're going to be holding your organization accountable by putting this goal within a um, framework that makes it likely that you can determine whether or not this goal was met. Objectives, the textbook talks about, are defined as operational goals, meaning that the objective focuses on how to reach the goal. So the question is, uh, it, it, how do you actually do it? So how are you trying to meet your goal? And that here is uh, explained in 
the text by saying, develop 20 theme nights designated to attract key constituents to the games, uh, hoping that 10 of these games will be sellouts. Uh, similar to the, the goals, these objectives are concrete and measurable, but also provide some flex flexibility so managers can be more creative. So again, it's even more detailed about how you're actually going to meet your uh, goals that help you accomplish your mission statement. And then uh, finally, we have uh, tactics, which are introduced. Uh, the, the tactics are just goals that are introduced at a managerial uh, mid-level uh of the organization, so the mid-level managerial part of the organization, and they're focused on what needs uh, have to be accomplished to reach that uh, strategic goal. So, in order to sell out the do the the, the twenty theme nights with the, the ten sellouts to meet your goal of providing uh, wholesome and affordable entertainment, um, an organiz the organization is going to contact local church groups, uh, also develop ethnic several ethnic nights. There's going to be fireworks, there's going to be giveaways, there's going to be all kinds of fun stuff in order to stimulate this um, excitement, this entertainment that's going to get, your, get you your sellouts and meet your uh, mission. So again, the tactical goals, your tactics uh, build on your objectives and your objectives build on your strategic goals and your strategic goals build on your mission statements. So it really is all, it's all like a pyramid. Exciting, I know. So then, once an organization has actually gone through its planning process, so it's got its mission statements, it's got its uh, objectives, it's got its goals, it's got all this great stuff. Um, it's got it's it's doing doing planning from both both a long term and short term perspective. And long term is going to be any uh, aspects that take longer than one year. Um, then the organization can move into its uh, organizing standpoint. So it's got its budget all together and, and it's ready to go. So now that you've actually uh, know that you want to provide that uh, uh, fun and affordable atmosphere entertainment, now you gotta go through the organizing uh, uh, part of it. And that's really, an organization is gonna be preparing it itself to execute the strategy that it created during the planning stage. It's the process of delegating and coordinating tasks and resources that are uh, that will make it so an organization is able to achieve its objectives, its goals, and ultimately its mission. So that might entail an organization setting up a organizational position uh, tree, its chain of command. You know, the CEO is at top, and then the executive level managers, and then the mid-level managers, and then the front line people, and then the interns and the volunteers, and so on and so forth. So there's a chain of command. Then, and once the organization has set up its, its positions and its chain of command, then an organization might need to hire individuals in order to execute its plan. So job announcements need to be uh, created, and then interviews, and then the hiring. So um, this kind of all builds on itself. So we have down here at the bottom an example of a chain of command, the graduate assistant that helped, that then reports to the sales coordinator, that reports to the director of sales, then the senior director of sales, then the associate AD for external relations. So it flows up. And each of these have a job description and job responsibilities. So once the organization has created structure in order to help to effectuate the plans that it had drawn up to meet its mission, then we've got the implementation stage, and that's really how an organization executes its goals and objectives with the appropriate personnel that's been hired. So um, how would the New Haven Flounders execute its strategy of providing that fun and affordable family uh, entertainment based off of the goals and objectives? Well, they would probably uh, have to stage baseball games and also have to um, get their marketing people and community relations people to get out into the community to recruit those uh, elements um, of the ethnic night and the fireworks and get, get uh, religious organizations to come in. And then also make sure that they've hired the correct people to manage the facility and to sell tickets, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then once an organization has executed its strategy, then uh, the controlling stage uh, uh, begins, which is evaluating the work of those who reported to the manager and providing an ap appropriate feedback to that manager, whether positive or negative. So from a facility uh, manager standpoint, it would be maybe the operations individuals uh, for, for baseball ops um, uh, determining whether or not they were successful at staging uh, the aspects of making sure the facility was well, was, uh, well managed, that the, the lawn was uh, well manicured and that there were no issues with the, the field or the ballpark uh, structure, uh, cleanliness, et cetera. And maybe from an executive level, that might be taught having the executive's uh, lieutenants uh, meet with her and then provide feedback as to whether or not the organization was successful in meeting those goals. So the question is, how would you evaluate whether the founders managed the manage or whether or not you have managed the founders effectively? Maybe you look at tickets sold and sellouts and what uh, what were the how many theme nights they had and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be some examples of how the managerial functions from a, um, from those standpoints actually played out from a planning. Um, organizing, implementation, and controlling standpoint. And of course, the job of a facility manager becomes even that much more difficult when we're talking about stakeholders, because in addition to the facility manager needing to have that those managerial skills, planning, organizing, implementation, and controlling, and then technical skills of what uh, how to uh, deal with uh, running the technical aspects of the facility from a maintenance standpoint and then a human relations standpoint, then a facility, a, man, a facility manager also must know how to interact with stakeholders. Well, what are stakeholders or who are stakeholders? Well, I'm glad you asked that because stakeholders are really just constituents or it could be people or businesses who have a common interest in an outcome of the organization. So, who are your most important constituents? Well, that really depends on the situation. Um, the most important constituents could be the organizations that are providing um, an or, uh, a facility with funding for that facility to be built. So maybe it is the bank, or maybe it's a, a governmental entity that's going to be giving tax breaks to the facility uh, so it can uh, it can get special special treatment or Perhaps the most important stakeholders are the fans who come and watch games because if the fans are not coming to the games, then they aren't going to sell tickets and they're not going to make money. So um, the different stakeholders uh, that the textbook talks about are customers, uh, internal stakeholders, and internal constituents, and external constituents. So uh, the textbook talks about them in groups. So group one are those who... Uh, are served or affected by the facility. So this would be uh, people who are uh, paying for tickets, the clients or guests, or it could be community groups and elected officials. Um, they're usually external uh, constituents. Um, group two is going to be anyone involved in the facility, such as staff or um, those who are management or um, those who are funding the organization. Those are called internal constituents. Um, it could also be potentially a sponsor. Thirdly, group three are any sort of those who um, have an ability to evaluate uh, the organization, either reports or studies. And those are going to be banks or government organizations or investors, taxpayers, anyone or anyone else who might be affected by the facility. So um, those aren't usually going to be customers. Those are going to be external. Uh, those are going to be um, distantly external stakeholders. And so these stakeholders all come together and uh, complicate the relationship with a facility manager because the Facility manager must now worry about more than just an organization being able to run its facility smoothly without any maintenance issues or safety issues, but then also 
um, how the community itself interacts with the facility. It could be those who live close to the facility. It could be uh, the, the local government entities, or it could be um, sp uh, sponsors or fans, um, et cetera. So when, in, when a facility uh, is been constructed, uh, it has to also see itself at times as a member of that community because issues do come up and they have to deal with stakeholders. So here is an example of a facility having to deal with issues related to other stakeholders. So just take a look and we'll come right back. There's a lot of excitement surrounding upgrades to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. However, one group has mixed reviews. WNCT's Zora Stevenson joins us now from Forest Hills and has more on what homeowners are saying. Right through the trees right here, you can see the scoreboard to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. And if I just walk a couple of steps, you see this house right here is one of four that is going to be bought because of this expansion. And this is the entrance to the Forest Hills neighborhood, an area that is going to see a lot of changes. We wanted to be close to the stadium. We wanted to be close to football, baseball. I'm an ECU alumni and, a, and an ECU Pirate Club member for over 30 years. I love the football program. It's no secret the Forest Hills neighborhood is a part of Pirate Nation. You know, everybody's a pirate, so everybody gets along great. Most people in the area are excited about the expansion. They just want to know how it's going to impact them. thought it was great for the football program, but not necessarily good for the neighborhood. In order for the renovations to become a reality, the university has to purchase four houses on Fieldside Street. Two families have already left their homes. Neighbors say a third will be out at the beginning of May. And while people on Rosewood Drive don't have to move, they're kind of upset they're hearing everything through word of mouth. They haven't really communicated with us. Um, we kind of saw the video like everybody else. The only reason I know about the expansion, as I said, I've been a Pirate Club member for over 30 years, so I see it from that information source, but not because I'm a resident of the neighborhood next to the stadium. Neighbors say parking and high volumes of traffic are something they're always worried about. At the end of the day, they just want to be in the loop. What is the plan? Because we are right here at where the expansion is going to be in. We reached out to ECU and they told me that anything having to do with how the university communicated with residents in this area has to go through athletic director Jeff Comfer and we were told he was out of town. I then reached out to athletics and they told me their department is not handling this situation. Live in Greenville, Zora Stevenson, not on your side. There's a lot of... Ex so as you can see, there were different stakeholders involved with the uh, expansion of that stadium. Uh, there were the stakeholders who lived in the community, uh, the uh, homeowners. There's also the government uh, who deals with um, the parking aspects and uh, the public safety uh, from that stadium. There was the university itself as a general entity, but then there's also athletics and the facility, uh, the facility manager that uh, contr that controls that stadium. And as you saw, there was some sort of issue involving communication about what's going to happen with the people who own houses in that community. Um, and then the reporter mentioned that the university said that all communications need to go through athletics, but then the athletic director was out of town and athletics said, no, uh, we're not handling this, um, this matter. So there's some miscommunications, there's some issues involving stakeholders. Um, perhaps um, those homeowners also said that they go to the games as well. So they're customers as so there's mul they're different there are multiple uh, kinds of stakeholders. So this can really complicate uh, situations. Maybe uh, there's a sponsor that has a connection with that neighborhood. So um, the facility manager uh, has a job that's very complex that requires um, a wide, array of skills like the textbook mentioned and when the facility is empty there are still a number uh, of stakeholders so even if the facility is not being used or if it's uh, abandoned or it doesn't have a tenant um, it's still members of that local community that that uh, where that facility is located uh, are stakeholders um, the government that is uh, tasked with potentially funding that facility as a stakeholder uh, those in charge of uh, uh, maintenance of the facility, both inside and externally, they're, they're stakeholders, so it makes it still makes things very complicated. And, um, and then heavy family friendly areas do uh, enhance the appeal uh, for stakeholders because going back to that founders 
example. It helps with the uh, family-friendly aspect. And if you juxtapose this sort of family-friendly area with, um, if anyone has been paying attention over the last few years, um, the Wrigley Field um, is very iconic. Uh, it's where the Cubs play, and it's nestled in a neighborhood called, called Wrigleyville. And there are homes that have these rooftop stadium seating where people can sit on these roofs and actually watch the, the uh, Cubs game. And those homeowners with the rooftops are one set of stakeholders. The people who pay to watch the games on the rooftops are another stakeholder. The city itself is a stakeholder. And the Cubs are, are, are the Cubs management is a stakeholder. And they are having um, a great, they had up until uh, recently been in dispute about the improvements that were being made to uh, Wrigley Field that were going to um, obstruct the view that some rooftops had of the stadium. So again, that led to um, in issues and discord involving all the stakeholders. So this is a complex subject, and the, the, the complex subject gets even more uh, arduous when you're bringing into question um, uh, specialized venues, uh, such as you ha have here in the Forbidden City, uh, which um, uh, is an area that does not traditionally uh, host uh, sporting events or special events. So it, it makes things very difficult for, a stakeholder, for uh, stakeholders and facility managers. So um, just kind of thinking about our situation, who are the stakeholders for our university and, and, and our athletics facilities and what priority should be given to each group and why? And, and think about why is that the case? Who are the most important? So these are a few uh, aspects that we covered today. The, the various aspects of managing a facility from the managerial uh, asp, uh, level, such as the, the planning, organizing, implementing, and controlling, and then the technical skills, uh, the, the emerging new, uh, new skills, such as uh, um, L, uh, um, environmental aspects and, the, and aspects involving uh, potentially dealing with multiple tenants, and then interpersonal communication, risk management, safety, um, uh, the actual maintenance of the facilities, so I can go on and on and on. And then uh, examining the different functions from planning, organizing, implementation, controlling, and then issues involving uh, stakeholders. So it's very complex, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you about this as we move forward. But you know, as we go through our site visits, kind of think about uh, what are what are the a wide array of um, aspects of that facility manager and what are what's unique about that facility that we're traveling to. And then maybe ask questions about the, the planning, organizing, implement, implementing, and controlling aspects of that facility. So that's pretty much it. As always, you can reach me via email. And I hope uh, everyone had a, an enjoyable lecture.